Our scripture this morning comes from Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter in verses 1 through 12, as we listen for God's word for us this morning. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to the Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite of Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead, as far as Dan, Nephtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar, the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the hand in the land of Moab, and the Lord's command. He was buried in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite of Bethphor, and no one knows his burial place on this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab during 30 days, and then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since then, there, never since has there ever arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. And, all, and for all the mighty deeds and all terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of of Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This Sunday, I think, is, is one, of, uh, one of those where the power rests in um, maybe not the words of the, the preacher, but in the names that are read. And thinking through the, the people's lives who we've remembered. Um, if, if that's true, um, I probably should keep my words brief, which I will try to do. Um, not always good at that. Our scripture as, may strike us as an odd scripture. Uh, it, it's the close of, of the, the first five books of the of the, the, the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the law, uh, referred to as a group. And um, it's, it's in this scripture that we have, uh, you know, the people who've been led by Moses uh, out of slavery into freedom through the time of wandering in the wilderness, and they are on the precipice of entering into the promised land. They stand uh, ready to, to make that move, and, and Moses uh, has led them all that way, has led them right up to the edge, and there they are at the, the, the river, and they're ready to, to move forward. And he goes up for a last conversation with God before, and uh, he's there speaking with the Lord, and the Lord tells him, I mean, it tells us how faithful, how amazing uh, Moses has been. And it tells us that, uh, Moses, you don't get to go. Um, you've led the people through all this time. You've faithfully lived your life fully and wonderfully and in so many marvelous ways. And, and now it's time for them to move on and for your life to be over and to be ended. Um, 120 years, wow, uh, that's a long time to have lived. Remember on a mountain probably 80 years before in his life, uh, he had an encounter with the same God from that mountain where he began to hear God's calling in his life to lead the people to this moment where now he has led them. And at that moment he stands and he looks and they get to go where he doesn't. 
Um, it's, it's in, in some ways, in, in our world, we would look at that and we think, oh, well, what a shame, what a tragedy. Uh, I mean, he got to go right up to the step and he didn't get to quite cross over. Um, Reinhold Niebuhr, a, a theologian, a, primarily the middle part of the, uh, the 1900s, the 20th century, uh, was on cover of Time magazine. He, uh, ethicist, he, he spoke words prophetically to our, our country. And he said, nothing really worth doing can be done in one lifetime. Um, there's always more. There's always more for the task. There's something new at the end of one journey for another to begin and to move forward. And Moses is on that place. And it's no longer the story of Moses. It's no longer the five books of the, the Pentateuch. It, it now is for someone else to lead and to move forward. Um, Moses has done his part. He has lived faithfully. He has served faithfully. And... Um, and he, in this moment, stands ready to let that be enough and for the people to move forward. It, it's an interesting scripture um, because we might feel like he would feel let down. But, but let me tell you a little bit about that. It says in the, the reading, it, it's interesting how it just kind of moves through this. It says, and he was buried there, but no one knows where he was buried it doesn't tell us who buried him. Why is it no one would know? In fact, it says that he was buried. He buried him there. I, I, is, would it be that the Lord did? That the Lord took care of Moses in that moment, um, in that parting of his life, that it was the Lord who was with him in those moments and that he didn't die alone. He um, had the Lord present with him and the Lord took care of those things. No one else knows. Maybe it's important that we don't know uh, because we want to understand that Moses' power comes from the Lord. It's not because of who he is. Uh, it's because of what the Lord has done in and through him. It's amazing to hear. Just think back. Maybe the thing that, that comes to most of our minds, I printed out the words just so I get them right. Remember the night before he died, Martin Luther King Jr., he reluctantly went. He was not feeling well. He was sick. Uh, he he had, had, had traveled to Nashville to be a part of the, uh, the garbage workers' protest and, and their march. And um, the night before they were having a rally, he was to, to lead the march the next day. He, he really didn't feel like it. They were calling him, you know, saying, you got to get here. You got to get here to come. And so he very reluctantly went. And, and, and in the, the speech that he gave that night, he closed by saying, um, we've got some difficult days ahead but it doesn't matter to me now because I have been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I am happy tonight. I am happy and I fear no man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Those were his last words words that he spoke to any of us. The beautiful words of, in a sense, of just knowing and understanding and being at a place of peace in his life that, that he had done and he, it just seems to foreshadow what is about to take place in his life. In a way, um, such a leader is a lot like Moses, helping to lead a people. We come today thinking about Moses and legacy and handing off. And we think about those in our families, our loved ones, our family of faith that we celebrate with and have, have lived with and, and, and have, have lost this past year. Um, 
Think about so many of them. I'll not be even in this, so I apologize. But I'm just thinking through this list of names of people. It's not just a list of names, is it? It's people whose lives were intricately a part of our own. About Camilla Pinkston, who just prior to our having the service last year passed away. Um, she passed away on Halloween, which is a holiday she hated. And there's an irony there, isn't it? But she didn't live through that last Halloween evening. She also didn't want to be 100 years old. So three days prior to her becoming 100, she passed away. She did enjoy a really nice birthday celebration just prior to that. And it was an awesome time for family that gathered together. Um, think about her life and all the way that she impacted others. About Aline McMahon, I learned it was McMahon. I always, I, I, I think every, I don't know, every time I heard someone say it, they said McMahon. And, and so I, I you know, at, at her, her, her service, I really tried to drill into my head McMahon. And, and I did it most of the way, but I messed up once. And I said McMahon. And the whole family together said McMahon, you know. <laughs> they got it. Right, I didn't get it right. Think about her kindness, about her positivity. Um, I think about, I, I, I can just remember probably a half dozen conversations where in the Life Center, when UMW was gathered or Yet Set was gathered or some group was gathered there and sitting at the table and, 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 and someone, things were not going the way they wanted in their life. Something was wrong. And they were kind of going negative in the conversation. She would never let that be the last word. She would always find a way to say something positive and to turn the conversation to end in a positive note. It was almost a corrective. She was never that pointed. She would never do that. Um, but it was almost that way. It was this corrective that just guided to the right place. I think about on Monday mornings, she would come in didn't even turn the lights on in the sanctuary. She would just come through every pew, making sure that, uh, although we'd taken them all out during this COVID season, she would make sure there were the pencils in every one of the spots, there were the offering envelopes in every one of the places, that if you didn't put your hymnal back up, she put it back up for you, that the Bibles were all straight and neat, that uh, I, she just went through every pew every Monday morning to make sure it was all right and that it was good. David Sampson, who was a teacher, who shared his life so much in the, the context of, of, of helping to educate others, was a, a volunteer with the Special Olympics. Um, he was a person who loved the Rolling Stones. So whenever his service was here, people had Rolling Stones t-shirts on and, and uh, were gathered here uh, to celebrate his life. Think of Clint, uh, Clint and who uh, came into the life of our church pretty recently. Uh, he and Joy had uh, found each other and he had brought Joy to Joy's life. I, uh, I think of Clint, a, a good, kind, uh, hardworking man. Uh, he was very modest too. And uh, he had a lot of rent homes over in, uh, uh, in Norman and how he would go. And, and, and he would tell me about work projects he was doing on those places, something that needed to be fixed. And I, I would think, how in the world is he doing that? Uh, and he, just, he would go and take care of so much, a hardworking and a kind man. I think of uh, uh, Harold Jackson. Think about... Uh, his willingness to, to venture out in new ways in business and, uh, you know, trained as an educator. It, uh, part of the legacy he left was uh, being able to, to put together foundations to support uh, people in education, to train teachers, uh, work with the uh, Special Olympics. Um, we probably think, oh yeah, the guy who had the McDonald's and so many other McDonald's around here. Um, 
Uh, he, he was just a, a good man who, in generosity, whenever anything needed to be done in town, or any project came through and they asked for help, his answer was always yes. About Clover D. Shaw, uh, a very sweet, kind, quiet person, sang in the choir, uh, was, was here, was faithful, uh, did the right thing, the good thing, who was the financial secretary at the church for a period. Uh, think about her life and, and her family. Uh, Ed Chamberlain, um, he was a man of such uh, faithfulness in, in prayer and in life. Um, for years, was a part of a, a prayer group that would come at 6, 7, 6.37 in the morning and join in prayer together here at the, at the church. Um, after that group kind of had run its course, uh, he would come into the church office at nine o'clock. Uh, most of you probably have no idea of this. He'd come in and, and he would gather with the, the church staff and he would lead them in prayer every morning. Um, it was just something he, he wanted to do. And it was a ministry um, I remember him asking me about it before. Uh, he, he said, Scott, you know, I, I, I you know, usually go over to the drugstore, but before I go to the drugstore, would it be all right if I just came by and just would pray with the staff here at the church who would like to? And so um, he would gather there and they would join hands and they would start the day in prayer. It was a, an important ministry. Uh, of his, his life. There are a lot of other things we could say about each of these people. But I think about Bert Jensen. Think about her in this back row over here where she would come in and she would sit uh, quietly and with, with her uh, group of friends would always be there, um, always find her place. About her uh, love for flowers, how she'd even opened a, a flower shop for a period. I think about um, Jim and Carolyn Hall uh, singing in the choir for so many years. Uh, the way that they cared for this community as a teacher, as a dentist, um, all the, the ways that you, you had encounters with them, uh, we, we just we recall those and we remember. Um, what I, I remember most with Jim is just, uh, and we did this usually about once a year, a couple times a year, maybe we did four or five times and before they moved up to Edmond. And uh, he'd say, hey, Scott, you wanna go to lunch today or tomorrow? And uh, that always meant we were going to Ver Verdon. And, um, and we would go, he didn't wanna go at noon, he wanted to get there early. And when he walked in the door, he would ask, do you have a, a piece of, coconut cream pie. And he would get dessert before we ever uh, got lunch because he knew that sometimes they ran out and he wanted to make sure he got the piece. So, uh, I, you know, I think about, um, about Carolyn and um, if you ever were directed by Carolyn, you knew it, right? You know, there were uh, ways that she, uh, you know, saw something that needed to be done and she would make sure it got done. And um, sometimes could be a bit harsh, but, uh, but always seeking the good and the right thing. I imagine it's a skill that, uh, that fit her well in teaching. I think about uh, Gordon Spangler. Uh, what a, a long, full, rich life. Uh, you, you can't think of, of, of him without Paula, Pauline. I mean, they are together in, in our thoughts and in our memories. We, we uh, just we think about them as so much. Um, it's hard to, to even kind of look out here without seeing them, you know, on the, the edge of the pew in the center. Uh, Gordon. I was enjoyed going to visit him, and, and I, I, I think he enjoyed me coming to visit, and uh, we would, you know, just have, have good conversations. The, the thing I just, I never can get out of my mind is how approaching 100, he decided it was time to quit uh, gathering hay, cutting hay, and, uh, and so he sold his equipment. But the next time it came to cut hay, he drove to the neighbor's house and got the equipment and brought back to cut the hay. You know, I, it, it, it just couldn't leave him, you know. Um, beautiful life. 
I, I just, we think through so many memories about Lou McNaff and, and why I know you all are sitting over here. She always sat over here. And, uh, and, and Angie often would sit right in the same proximity and, and uh, it, just the, having the conversation and the getting to know one another, uh, how proud she was of her family, how much she loved her family. Uh, we, we think about ways that she, you know, she was always came uh, showing her best, always dressed perfectly, uh, always wanting to look pretty, to look nice. That was, that was a part of, of her life, and we think about that uh, today, about how she uh, loved and cared for her family and shared her life so generously. Think about um, Reverend Don Horton and the time that he spent in service in this congregation and as a part of this congregation. Um, but as a pastor, I, I have to tell you, uh, his service was so much bigger. You know that, but, uh, but, but long before I had a connection to this church, um, I got to know Don, uh, probably because I'd gotten to know his family uh, from college. And, um, and then whenever I came back to be a pastor here in Oklahoma, uh, that first year, we served churches that were just a couple of miles from each other in Oklahoma City. And um, I ended up leading for our Oklahoma Conference, the Hispanic Ministries Task Force. And he, nothing slipped by him. That was no big, important job. There were lots of people who did different things. But he noticed it in the reports at annual conference. And so every time I would see him, he would say, Buenos dias, senor. And... Uh, uh, he, he, he wanted to greet me in a way that, knew, that he, I knew, he knew what I was doing, but in a way that uh, was bigger than just our regular uh, community. I think, you know, for, for you, uh, he would often say guten tag. Uh, he, I've heard him say konnichiwa uh, whenever he would greet people. Um, he, it, was, it was fun. He did it because he enjoyed having fun. Uh, it was humorous, but, but it wasn't just that. It was that he wanted us to understand our world is so much bigger. God calls us to be a part of something that's far more than sometimes we get focused on our little part of the world. He wanted us to see that it's bigger. And it was a way of just a small reminder to bring that home. Think of uh, Shirley Wilson, who's a part of this church and community. Uh, Farming was what their family did and uh, the raising of cattle. And that was such an important part of, of her life. Uh, but her faith, her connection to the church was also central to who she was in the family and the farm and her faith. She enjoyed visiting uh, members of our church who were in senior centers and retirement centers. Part of uh, her ministry was visiting those people and uh, it always enjoyed visiting her friends that were there. And her favorite saying was to keep the faith, that we would keep the faith. Maybe a, a fitting word for us today, that we keep the faith. Of uh, Janice Ma uh, McVeigh, uh, she was really kind of a pioneer, um, graduate of OCU's business school before many women were there. There were only two people in her class when she graduated there. Her uh, daughter also going to school at OCU and, and um, she ended up being in the same sorority that Angie was a part of there. And so kind of had connections that way. She encouraged and guided and showed support for her children and her family and her grandchildren. We remember her. About I, I, you know, you say LJ, I, I just have to say coach, coach pal. Um, and he was never my coach, but he was every coach that, uh, the best of every coach that any of us have ever had. And, uh, and, and just the, the specialness of, of his life, um, the way that he helped shape so many lives as, uh, as a teacher, an educator, as a coach, um, as a church member teaching Sunday school, with relationships with others, uh, a presence always there, always insisting on the best, that we do our best, that we give our best. 
uh, a person who was a, a leader in desegregation uh, and as a coach, but, but also in the dean of students here. Um, and he talked about that often, that, that he, the part of the reason he had that job is because uh, he had served in places that um, allowed him to bring skills and experience to bear and to help uh, guide a community through such a time. Those weren't always easy times. They're not easy times. I remember growing up in Oklahoma City schools at the time they were integrated. Um, lots of my friends and families around us left. Uh, we stayed. I went to Edwards uh, Fifth Year Center Middle School uh, over in northeastern Oklahoma, in northeast Oklahoma City. Uh, those were not always easy times, but there were important lessons learned and important work done. And uh, Coach Powell was a part of that and guiding that process. There, it, so many important things about the lives of the people we remember their love and their care, their authenticity. And Erwin, who we lost most recently, um, in the time I've been here as a pastor, she's been in the assisted living and um, uh, that time has not been easy uh, for all the family. Uh, but we remember that, that there's so much more than just those moments, that, um, that she, how much she loved the church, how much she loved music and singing. She uh, had a, a baby grand piano and she loved playing it and you know the songs that she played. They were all the hymns of the church. That's what she enjoyed to do. Uh, her family and love of music were the things that sat at the center of, of her life. Uh, Joe Epperson, uh, his enjoyment of work. Uh, the thing, you know, I, again, uh, this place becomes a sacred place to us in a way, uh, you know, in, sitting in the, the Life Center and uh, as waiting for a meal to start or over the conversations in the meal, uh, talking with Joe about his uh, work and uh, drilling wells and places that took him and uh, drilling a well, uh, even in honor of his wife that uh, was named for her. We, we just think about uh, how much uh, he, he worked and cared for his family and his home. Uh, if you ever went to his place, he would show you his shop in back uh, where he did his woodworking and, and the things that he enjoyed. Uh, those are, they're important pieces of our lives that, uh, that we remember and we celebrate. We remember Jean West, a good lady, part of the UMW, her, uh, she and her husband uh, farming for, for so many years. She loved to go on drives that toward the, the end of her life with family to drive out to Middleburg where the, the farm had been. And um, she would always enjoy being able to spot, be the first one to spot the bulls. Uh, she she was a, had a keen eye for that and loved birds and loved uh, uh, being able to spot and identify every bird that she could. Had lots of books about all the different birds. Uh, she enjoyed whenever UMW would come out hosting, she would uh, bring out her pretty dishes to be able to, to host. And that was something that was important to her. Um, I, Yovana, I, talking to her, she uh, told me that that you know, they, they would always, every Friday night, would be together, their families would, and uh, would play cards with each other. And that Yvonne said, sometime the conversation came up that, that she had never had fried green tomatoes. So, um, so Jean got some, prepared them, invited her over, and the two of them just enjoyed uh, fried green tomatoes together. Uh, people whose lives matter people who are connected to us. And so we remember them this day. We celebrate their lives. We know that, um, that sometimes in our grief and in our sorrow, uh, we feel alone. Um, but the truth is um, they are never alone and we are never alone because we are a part of God's great kingdom. And the communion of saints are not not the saint doesn't mean you were perfect. Saint means you're a follower of Jesus. 
and, and that the communion of saints are all those who have followed Jesus in the course of life and who have gone before, but those who are doing so today and all those who are yet to come that we don't even know yet. Um, and when we gather for worship, we gather and we connect our worship to the worship of the heaven. And they're singing praise to God. And that when we sing our praise to God, our chorus joins theirs. And they are here with us in ways that we can't even fully understand. Present with us in heart, but present with us even as we worship this day. And so we remember them. We celebrate their lives. And um, even though we would always love to have more, and like Moses who sits on the mountain looking over the promised land, we know that our promised land uh, is where they are today and that we will join them one day in this great company of heaven and the saints who have led the way. Amen.